Now here's standard number three. Uh, there are nine uh, standards and most of them are unexceptionable and there's only two that have been a little bit troubling and that's three and nine so I'm going to just sort of highlight those. The, stand the secretary's standards were first published in 1977 and were most recently revised in 1995. I have a personal connection with the standards because as a fresh graduate of the University of Virginia's architecture school, I worked in the Washington office of the National Park Service at the time when the standards were being written and in the very same room where I had my desk. And I well remember some of the discussions that my colleagues had while reviewing the drafts. I, having been, you know, at that time a very low-level employee, of course, had nothing to do with them except to be the fly on the wall. The document, as most of you know, uh, sets out nine standards governing the care and alteration of historic structures as well as additions to them. It was originally intended to define work eligible to receive federal matching grants and tax credits to encourage the preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and adaptive use of non-federal properties on the National Register of Historic Places. Soon, though, local res uh, jurisdictions across the country appropriated the standards to govern their own local preservation programs. As a result, over the years, the standards have become the de facto national preservation policy for the entire United States, something they were never intended to be. While most of the Park Service document is unexceptionable, there have been some difficulties in applying it outside its originally intended scope. First of all, as John Sandor, architectural historian with the uh, branch of the Park Service that uh, administers the standards, has pointed out that the standards were written to regulate treatment of individual historic structures, they were never intended to regulate entire historic districts. Secondly, some of the terms in the document, especially in standards three and nine, have been subject to a wide range of interpretation, both within the Park Service and by the local authorities who have adopted the, uh, the standards. The issue of application to districts I'll come back to a little bit later, but first let's look closely at standards three and nine and how they've been interpreted at different levels. Now, I don't have to read this to you. You see it. You're probably all familiar with this. But the key phrase here that I'd like to direct your attention to is that bit about a false sense of historical development. This was originally intended to prevent the antiquing or backdating of her, uh, histor historic sites or designing an addition that would appear to predate the original structure. It also proscribed cobbling together new buildings or even entire what were called historic villages out of salvaged parts or relocated structures. As one of the original authors of the standards, Brown Morton, put it, the intent was to prevent making historic sites, quote, more historic than they really were, unquote. A visitor should not be deceived about the history of the site and interpretive materials, such as explanatory texts or historical markers, would be important tools for informing the public about the historical development of the site. We must also remember that in the 1970s, when the standards were written, no one imagined that well-trained architects would once again design buildings in traditional styles. Rather, the Park Service writers were concerned about the way uninformed kitsch of the time might diminish the authenticity of historic places. They wanted to retain buildings as much as possible on their original sites, and they wanted to discourage a market for salvage that would create incentives for stripping or demolishing historic buildings. These were real concerns 35 years ago, though largely due to the beneficial influence of the standard, these are less of an issue today. But standard three has also been interpreted more broadly to mean that any addition or infill must not only avoid confusing us about the historical development of that particular site, but must also conform to the official history of architecture in general over the last century or so. Preventing what is called a false sense of historical development in this view meant that the date of construction of each part of the site should, at a glance, project the style of its historical period as defined by historians and scholars. Whatever did not conform to that official history, for example, building in a traditional style after the Second World War, was considered fake or false history. Such an attitude is illustrated in the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission's staff 
response to this 2003 proposal to build a new, not a restored, but a new elevation on the ground floor for a Georgian Revival apartment house whose ground floor was insensitively modernized in the 1960s and whose original configuration was not documented. The architect was told that the only acceptable approach would be to restore the curtain wall or create a contemporary design, but in no case would an elevation conforming to the Georgian style of the building be approved. But a view of history that sees traditional architecture as false and modernist design as true is no longer credible. We now recognize that the history of 20th century architecture is more than the history of modernism, as told by Siegfried Gideon and Nicholas Pevsner, whose books many of us read in school. In fact, it is their history that is false, because the official narrative does not account for how architecture actually developed over the last century. More recently, historians have enlarged our sense of what might constitute a true sense of historical development, and it is a diverse story. And so is the architecture of today. If both Quinlan Terry and Frank Gehry are alive and designing buildings today, then it follows that we must accept both of them as of our time. It makes little sense to make preservation judgments that try to prescribe in advance what the architecture of our time is presumed to be. Deciding that should be the job of the architects, not the job of the preservation authorities. Indeed, the most important development in architectural design over the last three decades, in my opinion, has been the rejuvenated practice of traditional architecture and urbanism. And there are now hundreds of architects around the country with the training and talent, and in abroad as well, with the training and talent to integrate historic resources into the contemporary built environment and adapt them as paradigms for new work. New traditional architecture, therefore, is not false history, but the ongoing development of traditions that did not die in 1925 or 1945 or any other year for that matter. Um, I should uh, point out the drawing on the right, which is a drawing from a student of mine uh, in our studio in Rome. Uh, my students, who are 21 when they come, or turn 21 while they're in Rome, uh, designed freely and confidently in the classical tradition as well as in other traditions, proving that that language is not dead. It can be taught. Now, we have no choice but to accept the pluralism of contemporary architecture and make judgments on the basis of appropriateness rather than a kind of predetermined scheme for how history is supposed to have developed. In any case, we must pay more attention to place than to time. To do otherwise is to engage in an aesthetic prejudice and to condemn our historic set settings to unnecessary loss. There is another consideration. Restoration and reconstruction in the same styles and building uh, uh, traditions as the historic structures also allow us to sustain the construction crafts that will ensure the future of these same historic resources. How many times have we heard people say, you cannot design new buildings in uh, historic styles because there are no craftsmen to build them? This is simply not true, as I hope will become apparent from the examples I'm showing today. And, as, uh, and there's, there's more to it, because as professionals working in this field already know, uh, the building cultures, meaning the bodies of knowledge, the formal languages, the craft traditions, the craftsmanship that built much of the historic architecture of the United States, either survive or are recoverable. These things actually can be taught, and there are actually people around who remember from, their, uh, uh, from the masters who taught them. I'm going to have the honor of giving the commencement address in May at the American College of Building Arts in Charleston, which you see pictured on the right, where uh, traditional building crafts are taught to both, for both restoration and new construction. The program trains craftsmen in masonry, plaster work, metal work, timber framing, carpentry, and other skills, and at the same time gives them a college degree. This is a program that deserves everyone's support, and if you don't know about this program, I urge you to Google it and learn more about it. The, um, 
what it does too is it creates opportunities for these new artisan scholars to show us what they can do. Indeed, the only way the traditional craftsmanship will become more available is to create more demand for it while also increasing the supply. Preservation programs could be a huge uh, uh, influence in doing that. Now let's turn to standard nine, which is the part most subject to varied interpretation. Here again, I think most of you are familiar with this language. The two most important adjectives are those differentiated and compatible. Now differentiating new work from historic fabric has a long history, stretching back to the early 19th century at least, and the restoration of the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum by Stern and Valadier. Here the restorers recomposed the surviving fragments of the Roman marble arch and completed the missing parts in a similarly colored but distinguishable travertine. They also reproduced only the architectural elements, not the antique sculptural embellishment, and they left the new columns unfluted. On first glance, we see the Roman design of the triumphal arch as a whole. On closer examination, we can identify what is antique and what is modern. The vision of the whole facilitates our understanding of the work as an architectural composition, as a work of art. Our ability to see the difference between the surviving and the modern material offers us a correct understanding of the history of the monument itself. The new work is differentiated and it is compatible. It is also very subtle. But in recent practice, Standard 9 has been interpreted in ways far from subtle. Whereas for Valadier, contemporary architecture in his time defined itself consciously in continuity with the tradition represented by that Roman arch, today fashionable architects define their approach largely in opposition to the architecture they are supposed to be compatible with. Differentiating, therefore, comes naturally, but compatibility is more difficult to establish and define because our contemporary culture